Hey guys, welcome. We're going to need to get started because we have a hard end time. And especially, you know, there's like 60 kids in there. So we really have to, we have to end on the right time. So that means we have to start as well as we can. So I want you to know that we are really glad you're all here. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's been a while since uh, we've had a marriage class here at Journey Church. So obviously the need is great. <laughs> We're, and, we're all fighting the battle. And it's, it is a victory just to get here. I'm proud of you guys. Yep, yeah. And if you had a fight on the way here, don't raise your hand, okay? <laughs> uh, but, so. <laughs> For the and, record. Yes, you, you're not, you know, where there's going to be some table discussion time, and there, you're not required to share anything. I want you to know that, that this is a safe, a emotionally safe place. No embarrassment zone. Right. And you okay. won't be put on the spot. Nope. Nobody will ask you a question. And if you decide, if you go home and decide you do want to talk about something next week, you can do that. But if you decide, no, let's not talk about that, then don't. It's okay. Right. And, it, and it's better if if you do want to share something because what's happening in our lives is really important and you're going to find as we share things from our life that we're all in this same boat here yeah and so this the um oh the thing to remember too is that what's said at the table stays at the table mm -hmm. and we all know that and yep. so the format the basic format of the class the marriage 101 classes that we have is there's 30 minutes of Ernie Lee and I will teach and share and tell stories. And then we have approximately 30 minutes of a world-class teacher. Because you'd get tired of us as good as we are. Oh, we're good, yeah. Um, uh, but to mix it up with somebody who is a seasoned communicator is really good. And then we shoot for table discussion at the end. Because in a church this size, it's really hard to get to know people. But a table is a great place to break down some walls and get mm -hmm. to know people. And that's, that's what we're doing. And so we're going to close the meeting at 8 o'clock. And then you have to go get your kids right away. If you right have away. kids here, you have to go get them. But if you don't, then sometimes what happens at the table just needs to go on another 15 or 20 minutes, and you can talk as long as you want. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hope it spurs, getting to know each other. So I didn't notice that there, they it's were there. there. It is there. There mm -hmm. is a, a little form on your table if you have any specific questions. We definitely don't do it on the fly. Right. Big mistake. So um, if you have a question, just write it on the form, give it to us later, and yeah. then we'll answer it next week. And you can put it in the offering box. It's, we'll pull the questions out of there, too, if you need to. Um, and we really will try to answer those mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. we can. Um, we had really hoped to kind of tap some people on the shoulder to be table leaders so that the, your tables would go you know, easy for you, and just our own circumstances, um, we, we were unable to do that. So what we're saying is we're all in this together, mm -hmm. and some of you are talkers and some of you aren't, mm -hmm. okay? And you know who you are. <laughs> yes, and what we want, we believe everybody can be there for everybody else, and make it easy for one another. So we're asking you to all kind of rise up to the, the challenge of helping your table by making it easy and comfortable for the people around you, okay? So we, we're nominating all of you <laughs> to give what you can, to encourage what happens at the table to be fun and exhilarating and um, we all know, like the disciples, uh, Jesus said, well, are you going to leave me too? And they said, well, where would we go because you have the words of life? 
then we all have the words of life in us and the capacity to share them. So think about that. It will, it will encourage the people at your table. And we're, over the next six weeks, we're going to talk about some tough topics. And Rick and I are not shy. Okay, so brace yourself. We're going to talk about some tough topics. Um, but on the other hand, you are not required, again, to say one word that mm -hmm. you don't want to say. Okay? Mm -hmm. Got it? Okay. And, and so the, the, the world-class teacher we're going to use um, for at least this and maybe a couple of more is Mark Gungor. He's laugh your way to a better marriage. And that guy, you're going to see... And we're going to have to stop the video and in you're the all gonna middle go, oh, of where, no. you, where you don't want it to stop. But uh -huh. you're going to have to come back next week because we're going to start it again. But he will get you laughing, but brace yourself. You open your mouth to laugh, and truth is going to come right into it. Hit you between the eyes. So we'll know if you're trying to laugh without opening your mouth. And, he, you know, he, Mark Gungor has a lot to say about sex. And actually, so do we. And we're going to go there. Um, in our opinion, he's right on. But when you stop to think about it, sex is the one and only thing you can only do together as husband and wife. That's right. You can go fishing or bowling with anybody. Mm -hmm. Right? But this is one thing. The, that the exclusiveness God... that God designed it to be is so important. And again... You're not expected to share anything. Mm -hmm. So the story of our beginning. Um, Rick and I were together for over two years um, before we were married. We were heathens. Mm -hmm. We sinned. And we got married in January of 1972. And we gave our lives to Christ on March 19th, 1972. Right. So we... We got married, and then two months later, we got saved. And thank God. And, but we were both party animals, heathens. You know, it was the 60s and early 70s. And it, we were not what you would call had the capacity to really excel in marriage. Well, you're looking Our at families, two of the least likely to succeed people on the planet. Yeah. When, uh, when I was 17, my dad ran away with a woman down the street and, you know, um, put her kids through college, did all kinds of things, and, and just left me and my brother and my sister and my mom. And so we... We both had really tough families. Yep. You know, we're first-generation Christians. Right. And, and so the, the foundation was not what you'd call uh, the best Solid. to build on. Yes. So I, when I met, I'm the fun one. Okay. I'm the emotional one, I am the messy one, and he is the computer statue. Yes, everything it has to be in its place. and It has I, to have a place and be in it, and I was the type of person that would take a coat off and drop it. Right, and anything else that she, <laughs> she just dropped it. So, um, it's true. And you could almost see God say, this is going to be hard, but it's going to be good if I can get into the middle of this. And mm -hmm. um, We fought like cats and dogs. Yes. Over um, everything. Most, e everything. Of, most of what, because we were raised so differently, I was raised in a family where there was no outward emotion shown at all. Zero. I remember once my dad running and, and uh, helping my mom up because she like slipped down two steps. And that was, that's the high point of the emotional connection that I had. I, Her, on the other hand, was very clingy. Yeah, she, she still is a little clingy. <laughs> but she wanted to be held. And, and I, I thought, what I was the always heck like, is Rick, that? hold me. <laughs> and he was always like, get off me. Yeah, and, and don't you ever stop crying? It's like, <laughs> come on. So, so <laughs> the differences, we're trying to tell you the differences. Now, when we got saved, 
It was back in the Jesus movement. And if you were saved six months, you were an elder. You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you, knew, you must know what to do. And so being that I was saved six months, I was a leader in the church. And um, I had this woman. person from another woman. planet. A, a she woman. Was a, she's a woman. <laughs> but I did not know what to do with her. <laughs> except I could tell that she was broke. And so she needed help. She needed God's help. She needed to <laughs> submit herself to the word of God so she could get fixed. And I prayed and fasted periodically for her for five years. Five years that God would fix her. <laughs> Oops. Finally, God pinned me on the living room floor, and I cried a wet spot in the carpet as he and it finally got me to hear that I was the problem. Five years. And that wasn't the only time that he had to talk to me about things. And we, we there are both of us. We both have had to die to self and learn how to love. And the, the, here's the very first tip we want to give you. There is no man and woman mm -hmm. who are married together that are compatible. None. That's right. Forget it. Don't bother praying for her. It's all about praying for you because <laughs> God's got this thing. So God is bigger. That's why we shared our foundation is because God is bigger than anything you came into the marriage with. Mm -hmm. This God we serve knows exactly what you need, and he has the power and the wisdom to give it to you. Mm -hmm. And he's waiting for you to yes. say, okay, it's me, and, help and, me. And it, our generation, you know, we're, we're, we're getting old. And What's up with that? I know, it stinks. But... This generation, in this generation, everything in the world has changed. And this is very important that you hear me on this. Everything has changed, our society, people, what's going on. But God has not changed. Yes. So we are going to focus on the things that have not changed, which is God has not changed and his word has not changed. And so... Um, God's way is the way. Everything you dreamed about, everything you wanted to see happen, everything that when you got married and you were going to live happily ever after, that is still there. Yes, and he but can the, change anybody. I don't care what generation they're from. I don't care what family they're from. I don't care what they believed before. Mm -hmm. God can change every one of us mm -hmm. to to make our marriage the epic love story we've always That's wanted. Right. That's right. But we have to follow the scripture. And God's word will always lead us to life and life abundantly. And, you know, most people think that the Bible is full of suggestions. And it's not. <laughs> it is full of commandments. And when you, you can tell the difference between a suggestion, like... You know, maybe you ought to change your shirt. What? <laughs> that's a suggestion. Right. Do not change that shirt. Yeah, that's a yes, ma'am. That's a commandment. Do you get it? Yeah. And you, you have to read the word to understand the difference. Yep. So here's 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Not a suggestion. That's not a suggestion. And what will happen, part of that blessing is it will save your soul from sin from deception, from condemnation, and from hell if you are willing to allow God to come into you. Now, the way is hard <laughs> with or without him. It's hard. It's hard. But 
with him, you can have the relationship that you've always wanted and that you need. So uh, um, 1 Peter 3, 7, again, not a suggestion. Husbands, live with your wife with understanding. That's a commandment. You may never actually understand her. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. But how you relate to her will make her feel understood and happy that you care about her. That's right. And That's how to obey the scripture. Yeah, here's another one. Your body is not your own, but your spouse's. That's... Ooh class, couple of classes from now, we're going to talk about that one. <laughs> Again. How do we do that? Not a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you'll hear some funny, heart-wrenching stories from us because we're united in public, but the stories that we will share, like the bleak reality of five years and misguided prayer, and, that's know, a very real story. 50 years worth of living together or yeah, we, we have, have stories. We have a lot of stories, but you're going to find that we can share them because we have long walked away from the hurt and the pain that happened to get that story. Mm -hmm. And they are valid stories that have changed lives. And we have problems. We have had problems in every area you have ever had a problem in. Yeah, so we've been there. We've been there. And so you just need to know that, that there is... Well, the, the one thing that we have not done is adultery. Neither one right. of us have ever done adultery. And so, but the word of God can take care of that for you, yep. Yep. you know, but we've been pretty much everywhere else and we have determined to walk with God through it. Even when we were like, I really hate you, <laughs> you know, and yeah, we've yelled at each other. Um, we slept on the couch. Mm -hmm. We uh, didn't talk on the way to church a few times. Yeah. And so with the way Ernie was raised and the way I was raised, you can see that it's, you know, there's a lot of work needed here. So marriage is hard for everyone. But here in this class, you're not allowed to kick yourself around the block because you think you have it so bad. Because we've been there and a lot of other people have been there too. And this is a class about the restoration and the reformation of our lives as we come in to understand what God really has for us and the power and what it really can be and the hopes and the dreams. He will save you from wrong attitudes, wrong beliefs, bad habits, rudeness, and meanness. And he will give you strength to be compassionate. Ladies, you need to be compassionate to the guy. Amen. Amen. Men, you need to be nice to the girl. Yep. So his way works. He will save you from your wrong attitudes, wrong beliefs, bad habits, rudeness, and meanness. He will give you the strength to be compassionate and to have mercy and to Sacrifice. be able to let go of the way you want things done and realize that she might add to that and actually make it better. So that there's a lot to understand but we're trying to paint the foundation for what we're going to talk about. Now we're going to lay the first point. Okay? Let's pray. You've got to yep. pray. I'm going to pray first. Um, Father, we love you. And we've come with so many wrong concepts of what marriage really is and what it means to you. And I pray you disrupt those preconceived ideas and you speak life and your word and your truth about what you want it to be like and give us the power to face it and to let you um, redeem us, change us, shape us. So we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I know you don't have your Bibles here. It's okay. You can just listen. But... We're going to start in the beginning, in Genesis. So this is from Genesis 2, um, 7 through 25. And I'm just going to highlight it, okay? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and the breath in his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living being. 
The Lord God also planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man there who he formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree pleasant in sight, good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst. In verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat it you shall surely die. Another not suggestion. Yes. And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. <laughs> That's right. I will make him a helper. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast in the field of the air and all this stuff. And so Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds, and the beasts in the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper compar comparable to him. So here's the stage. Life was great. Just man and God. Now, man does not ask for anything else. <laughs> He's busy naming the animals, climbing the mountains, going, tending, checking this fruit out. This is pretty good. So I'm going to paraphrase verse 18. And the Lord God said, the party's over. <laughs> You're getting a helper, and it's not going to be another animal. And this helper is going to help you in ways that if I told you now, you would surely die. <laughs> so, so the point is, who said this? It was the Lord God that did this. He said it's not good that man should be alone. He said, I'm going to make a helper. Man did not design the helper. God did. And in verse 21... And the Lord God caused a deep sleep. He had no to, kidding. He had to put him <laughs> on his back, man. <laughs> he had to render him completely incapacitated. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs. Then the rib which the Lord God, the Lord God, had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And he said, Woe, man. It's like, wow, nice <laughs> job, God. So <laughs> Eve is the final crowning creation that the Lord God made. She is deliberately the way she is. God made her, and we needed her. Otherwise, we... You'd all still be naming animals. Yeah. So it was wonderful. And, and, you know, women, I want you to know that we really do think you're beautiful. We really love you. And God did that in us. You're special. And they lived happily ever after, right? Well, it says they were naked in the garden. They were, yeah. So they would have been happy, right? Wow. Happy, awesome. ev happily ever after, happy and naked in the garden. Yeah. And so... I mean, let's get real about it. How long did they actually live naked and happy in the garden? One stinking verse. <laughs> That's all they made it, one verse. And within 12 verses, the man had completely fallen and was explaining to God that it was the problem was this woman that he <laughs> gave her. And then they were out of the garden. And not much has changed in the last six or 7,000 years. No, We're still people. blaming the woman for our problems. <laughs> Lord, just fix this woman. So no. uh, just a couple of observations. Most of us men would have been left happy to be alone, to do whatever happens to be our favorite work, hobby, or activity. The proverbial, I'm going to the garage the fish and hole, or the program, or even the work of ministry can be just leave me alone, just leave me alone. But not one of us can resist a naked woman. 
It's part of God's plan. So not much has changed. In fact, if it wasn't for the sex drive, which the Lord in his infinite wisdom put in us, um, men would probably would remain like Adam was. <laughs> happy in the garden, maintaining the 10 millionth species of spotted owl, and in our cases, be hunting, finishing, golfing, whatever it is. But let's be real. Even God's work can be a place where we hide from intimacy. So many leaders in the church have missed the importance of their wife and that God did that. So number two, God made Eve comparable to him which denotes equality. She was not another species of animal or a possession of Adam's, which she means... She was a helper. She was never meant to be... Surround with support. Yeah. She was never meant to be just the cook or the house cleaner. That's or right. Or any of those things, the maid. <laughs> and she's not one of your buddies, for sure. But she was of equal yet different value. Joint heirs, co-laborers, the Bible says, husband and wife, walking with God together, loving one another, and helping one another. At least that's what God had in mind. And it's pretty safe to say Adam was most likely initially very happy with his new gift. <laughs> I mean, I was so happy when I met Ernie Lee. I thought we would never have a problem. Maybe closet space. But I, I, could, I saw nothing. I thought, this is the perfect woman. And even though Oops. Eve was comparable to Adam, she literally wreaked havoc in a really short period of time in his life. She upset the proverbial apple cart. Now, you could picture an apple cart. You well, know, you have to understand, like Rick. If Rick ever had an apple cart, they would be exactly where he wanted I mean, them to I be. I mean, I know, you know, I mean, I just know... <laughs> how an apple cart is supposed to, I mean, my life would have been just like that. And she came in and she said, just like that, and tipped that thing right over. What the heck? What's wrong with you, girl? And, and so it's possible that Adam would have gotten into trouble all by himself, but we'll never know, will we? <laughs> but in any event, by missing the point of being a helper... Eve helped lead Adam down a path of disobedience to God and completely changed everything. Now, number four is Adam could not see what was really going on, but he uh. was certain it was her fault and God's fault for giving um, this woman. And um, we can also see that God did not lay the whole blame on Eve either. So they both went out of the garden. And so my final observation is this. As time went on, the Lord has revealed through the gospel of good news that he not only orchestrated the whole scenario in the garden, knew exactly what Adam and Eve would do, allowed it anyway, and his plan for redemption unfolded with incredible and expected precision. Amen. His intention being that not only would mankind receive eternal life and forgiveness of sin, but the relationship between a husband and wife would eventually be a picture of what his own relationship with the church is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. That is why this marriage, this relationship is so important. Oh, um, sorry. Um, now you made me lose my thought. <laughs> the Bible says I in do Ephesians that, all the time. that if you look at how a man loves his wife, you'll see how I love my church. Man, we're falling down on, we're falling down on our hands and knees because we are not doing that like we're supposed to. But you can see the value of it is why there's such a battle. Mm -hmm. Because the enemy does not want anybody representing how Christ loves the church. So, of course, the pressure's on us. The enemy has got all kinds of strategies planned to wreck it. Mm -hmm. He's trying to wreck it. And God, at the same time, is saying, trust me. Yeah. Trust me. I got you. I got mm -hmm. everything you need. Will you just look at me? Mm -hmm. Because I have what you need. And so, it doesn't really matter how bad it's been. 
what you've been through, you can turn it around if you want to. Or if it's really great, you can make it epic. Yes. We kind of got our notes out of play here. So the point is God did this. There's no mistake. Men and women are not the same. And what a boring life it would be if they were the same. Per his design, they're different. And they're a gift for each other. Mm -hmm. And Honestly, if, if Rick and I can be together 52 years and we are having the time of our life right now, still, we've had adventures. You mm -hmm. young people, you need to have adventures in your life. Yeah. Let God lead you into adventures yeah. that draw you closer. And it might make you fight like cats and dogs to get through it, but you'll get if you get through it and then you learn how to love each other, you're going to have something you didn't have just a short while ago. Yep. And you keep doing that year after year after year. And before you know it, you're like, wow, well, look at us. Mm -hmm. Look at what God did. So the, the difference is, if you think about, we have two eyes, and just that little distance, you can see how far away something is. It's called depth perception. Your wife is in a completely different set of emotions and eyes and intellect and feelings and understandings. And we are different, but when we look at how to raise kids, how to deal with money, how to deal with anger, how to deal with sh where should we go, what should we do, what should our future look, what is retirement look, all of those things. If we were just one, we wouldn't have it. God designed the differences on purpose. And so our, um, what we're going to watch today, the, the clip from Mark Gungor, is he is really... Uh, good at explaining the differences. Mm -hmm. So that's what we got about a 30 minute watch on that. And you're not going to like it when we stop it, but and we'll, we'll come finish back, it you next know, week. We'll come back quick and talk about tables and everything, but let's get this video going. Hello, and welcome to Laugh your way to a better marriage. I'm so glad you're here. This is the marriage seminar for people who hate marriage seminars. <laughs> hoo -ah! All right. I get a kick out of watching the couples when they first come in on Friday nights. You know, the, uh, the girls, they're all lit up, you know, just, <laughs> ooh, I got him here, I got him here, I got him here. You know? <laughs> and, and the guy's going, Oh, man, I can't believe, you know, I got here. But it's cool, guys. You can relax. You're going to love it. This is not one of those let's beat up on the men for not being women seminars. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm talking about. What is it with that anyway? <laughs> man, you know, you ask a lot of women to describe their ideal man, and they'll describe another woman. <laughs> What's up with that? You know? So we're not going to do that. We are going to uh, uh, just go with this thing in a normal, healthy way. We're men. Men are men. We're not sick. We're not perverted. We're not twisted. You know, we're not broken. We're men. Yeah. All right? And God, yeah. Hoo -ah. and, <laughs> and God made us the way we are for a reason. And I'm going to show you girls what that reason is. Okay? And I'm going to try and explain to you uh, the world of men a little bit through this thing. We'll also discuss the women's side of things as well. But I really want you to understand this men thing. Women are much more complicated than men. Men are very simple. Simple. S-E-X. Simple. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> So we're going to have fun. We should have a really, really great time. Now, tonight we're going to do a session called The Tale of Two Brains, hence 
the two brains. And we're going to be discussing how men and women think very differently from each other. Why is that important? Because men and women are very quick to make into heart problems what are essentially head problems. A woman acts a certain way, a guy feels she doesn't care about him, he says, well, there's something wrong with your heart, you don't care about me. No, 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 it's the way she processes information. The same with a guy. A man thinks in a certain way, and a woman thinks there's something wrong with his heart. No, it's his head, okay? So I'm going to try and explain to you why, what, what that's all about. Then tomorrow morning we're going to do a session called, Why Does He Do That? <laughs> why does she do that? Okay? See, it's one thing to understand men and women in general. It's another one to understand the one you got stuck with. Okay? So I'm going to show you how you can discover specifically what makes your spouse tick. And it's powerful information that will absolutely revolutionize your relationship. All right? Then we're going to do what I call the Yo Mama session. And it's called the number one key to incredible sex. <laughs> and boys, if you miss that, there's just something wrong with you, okay? So you gotta, you gotta check. And then we're gonna end with uh, how to stay married and not kill anybody, okay? <laughs> All very deep emotional stuff. Now, <laughs> now, a lot of people say, well, what's your background? What's your, you know, what's your deal? Well, my background is that I'm a minister. Now, if you're not much of a churchgoer, don't let that make you nervous. Some of my biggest fans are heathens, all right? And this isn't one of those things where we sneak you in and then beat you over the head with a Bible, all right? But, but I do have a Bible verse I need to show you, okay? Because I found a Bible verse that if you followed the advice from this one Bible verse, you will never, ever, ever have a problem in marriage. How many think that's worth seeing? All right, you follow the advice from this one verse, you'll never have a problem in marriage. It says it, it's good for a man not to marry. All right? I said, well, now why would he say that? That's such a terrible thing to say. Because, because he goes on to explain, he who marries will have trouble in this life. <laughs> you know, people come up to me, Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, something's wrong, something's wrong. I say, what is it? I, we got trouble in our marriage. I go, no, that's about right. Hey, there ain't nothing wrong. That's, that's pretty normal. Now, you, you don't hear these verses read at weddings very often. <laughs> kind of downplay that. You, know, you don't see those on Hallmark cards. You don't see them on cakes with pretty calligraphy. He who marries will have trouble. But it's too late for you. You say, if that's the case, then why get married? Because marriage is absolutely wonderful. It's great. It's fantastic. But it's not that it's without trouble. All right? And I want to show one other verse to you. Now, you don't have the deep theological training that I have, so you might have a hard time understanding this verse. But I'll try and explain it to you. This is found in Proverbs. And uh, it goes like this. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean. <laughs> Let me explain that to you, okay? What does that mean? What it means is if you're going to have an ox, you're going to have ox poo, all right? Now, if you don't like poo, and most of us are not real big fans of poo, if you don't like poo, the temptation is get rid of the ox. Preach it, brother. No, no, no. I don't want you to get rid of the ox, all right? You know? So, well, well, why would you keep the ox around? 
because he goes to the second half of the verse, it says, because much increase comes by the strength of the ox. Well, now there's the catch-22. On the one hand, we all love the benefit of the ox, but nobody likes the boo. <laughs> and what he's trying to tell us here is you cannot have one without the other. There is no such thing as a poo-free marriage. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. Unless you shoot the ox, okay? That, <laughs> but that leads to other problems. <laughs> so this weekend is not about attaining a state of perfection in your life, all right? It's about getting a proper positive to poo ratio in your life. <laughs> you see, because if all you get is poo, then you got one sick ox. Are you hearing me? All right? So, but there's no such thing as a poo-free marriage. For those of you who are having a hard time grasping this, I have a mathematical version of it. It goes, uh, <laughs> ox equals poo over positive. Some say positive over poo. But anyway, it's the ratio that we want to get uh, going here, okay? Now, marriage is a wonderful institution. Statistically speaking, we know that married people are healthier than single people. They are actually happier than single people, assuming you're doing this right. Uh, or you can be profoundly unhappy. Uh, they actually make more money than single people, and I'll mention a little bit later why that's true, okay? Uh, they have better sex than single people. Now, you don't see that in our culture, you know, in all the movies and shows, you know, it's the single people all having really great sex, you know, and, and the married people are the... <laughs> you know, some will say, well, how's your sex life? Are you kidding? I'm married, ha. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not true, it's a bunch of baloney. Okay? Married people have great sex compared to single people. Single people don't even know what they're doing for crying out loud. Okay? <laughs> and statistically speaking, married people live longer than single people. Partic this is particularly true for men. Uh, one, statistically speaking, one of the most dangerous things a man can do in America today is remain single. It is the equivalent of smoking two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> it's true. They found that if you take a, of someone who has two and a half packs of cigarettes a day and, and the health problems and the shortness of life and all his difficulties, uh, and a single guy is pretty much the same. I guess the worst would be a single guy who smokes two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> All right? But marriage is wonderful. It's great. It rocks. I love it. Okay? If you do it right. Now, the problem here is so many people don't do it right. And it's not that they don't know, not that they don't want to do it. They don't know what to do. We live in a, in a culture today that seems to, for somehow in the relationship area to be completely completely clueless. We seriously don't know what to do. Now this weekend what I want to do is show you specific things you can do that will absolutely energize and transform your marriage life. How many think that's worth hearing? Yeah, okay? So, now I want to talk to you about what I call the, the laws of relational physics. You see, the laws of physics affect everybody, whether you believe them or not, okay? If I step off this stage, I'm probably, in all likelihood, going to go down. If I start floating around, you might want to freak out and run, but uh, <laughs> why? Because the laws of physics affect, well, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter what I believe. I'm going down, right? Doesn't matter if I'm a born-again Christian. Doesn't matter if I'm a heathen. It, man, I'm going, because it affects everybody. Well, just like that, there are laws of relational physics, and they affect everybody, whether you believe them or not. Now, this might come as a little bit of a shock uh, to those of you who are, are church people, especially hearing from a minister, but the truth is, you don't have to be a Christian to have a great marriage. I know a lot of heathens that have wonderful marriages. I know a lot of born-again Christians who have horrible marriages. Why is that? They're breaking all the rules. And they assume somehow that the rules don't apply to them, but they do. Here's an example. If you're driving a car 80 miles an hour 
around a curve that says only 40, and you keep going 80, chances are you're going to get hurt. Even if you're listening to a Christian radio station. <laughs> Even if you have a statue of Jesus on the, you know, he might be going, ah, you know, but uh, why is that? Because the laws of physics still affect you, but for some miracle, you're going to get hurt. Same true with relational physics. And I want to explain that to you, and we'll take a look at that. Now, this weekend, I'm going to be speaking to you in uh, basic stereotypes. In other words, women generally tend to be a certain way. Men generally tend to be a certain way. But they're not all that way. I get it. <laughs> okay. Some of the people, I just have a cow. Oh, I don't know. That's you for all men. I'm admitting it's not. All right? Just generally speaking, we don't have time to get into all the shades of gray. But generally speaking, men are a certain way, women are a certain way. Uh, if I start describing something that's not you, don't have a cow, just interpolate for your relationships. Uh, in Debbie's and I relationship, there are areas where we're completely opposite of a typical man and a woman. I remember when I was first studying this stuff, I thought, oh man, I'm a woman. <laughs> So just interpolate. I will say this, that if you, if you tend to be one way in a, in a certain relationship, your wife generally will be the other way. I, I don't think I've run across a couple yet, I'm, I'm sure they're out there, that act the exact same way. You know, so if you break the rules, chances are your spouse is breaking them right with you. And you, you just flip on this deal, okay? For example, a typical stereotype. Men are more interested in sex than their wives. Why would you say that? Because generally it's true. But it's not always true. There are a lot of relationships where the wife is much more interested in sex than her husband. Uh, if you're here tonight and your wife is much more interested in sex than you are, I think I speak for all the men here when I say that we hate you. <laughs> Please don't tell us who you are. <laughs> we'll, we will hurt you, all right? So, so just go with the flow. It'll be cool. We'll, we'll have a great time discussing this thing about marriage. Now, I believe marriage is a life-giving institution. We live in a culture today that believes marriage is a life-sucking institution. It will suck the life out of you. <laughs> All right? And that's why we say, make sure you're old enough. Make sure you have enough money. Make sure you have enough education. Make sure you've been dating for 37 years first. Make sure that, you know, get all this stuff. Why? You got to get everything together and ready so that when you say I do, you can withstand me. Ah! But it's not that way. It'll give you life if you'll do it right. If you do this right, marriage can be the closest thing to heaven on earth. If you do it wrong, <laughs> well, you fill in the blanks. Okay, so now, we're gonna start discussing men's brains, women's brains, and how they're very different from each other. Now, I wanna start with men's brains, all right? Now, men's brains, are, are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes. And we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car. We've got a box for the money. We've got a box for the job. We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We got, we got, we, we got boxes everywhere. A and the rule is, the boxes don't touch. <laughs> When a man discusses a particular subject, we go to that particular box, we pull that box out, we open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right?
And, and, and then we close the box and put it away being very, very careful not to touch any other boxes. Sorry, my Catholic upbringing got in there for a minute, but I... <laughs> I'm not a Catholic, but I went to Catholic school when I was little. I, I had a nun who taught on hell like she was born and raised there. I mean, I'll never forget it, but... Uh... <laughs> it did me good, actually. It was a good thing. Now, women's brains are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. And everything is connected to everything. <laughs> the money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. And it's like... <laughs> it's like the internet superhighway. Okay? <laughs> and, and it's all driven by energy that we call emotion. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons why women tend to remember everything. Because if you take an event and you connect it to an emotion, it burns in your memory and you can remember it forever. The same thing happens for men. It just doesn't happen very often because, quite frankly, we don't care. Uh, Women tend to care about everything. And she just loves it. <laughs> okay. Now, men, we have a box in our brain that most women are not aware of. This particular box has nothing in it. In fact, we call it the nothing box. <laughs> and of all the boxes a man has in his brain, the nothing box is our favorite box. <laughs> if a man has a chance, he'll go to his nothing box every time. That's why a man can do something seemingly completely brain dead for hours on end. You know, like fishing. That's, that's why a guy can sit in front of a TV and go. Uh, it glows. Uh. Of course, this drives our wives nuts because they'll come up and say, Stop! I'm not. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> now they've actually measured this. The University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago did a study and discovered that men have the ability to think about absolutely nothing and still breathe. 
<laughs> you know, they connected all the wires and stuff like that and watched the brain activity, then all of a sudden, he's <laughs> I think he's dead! Huh? You know, <laughs> women can't do it. They can't do it. Their minds never stop. <laughs> And, and they don't understand the nothing box! And it drives them crazy! Because nothing drives a woman more crazy or makes her feel more irritated than to witness a man doing nothing! Revelations I get out of women is this whole nothing box issue. They just, <gasps> everything's starting to make sense. <laughs> and and I, I've had women say, oh, oh it's nothing. Well, well, can I go in this nothing box with him? <laughs> no! <laughs> Why not? Because then it's something. <laughs> Besides, you'll walk in there and go, You know, you know, this place could really use some pictures. <laughs> My nice little table over here, some flowers, is it? No! Nothing! Get out! We don't want nothing! <laughs> now, this handles the way men, men and women handle stress. Okay? When a man is stressed out, all he wants to do is run to his nothing box. This is how we unwind. The last thing we want to do when we're stressed out is talk about it. We don't want to talk about it, we just want to... <laughs> of course, it just drives her nuts, you know. A woman will see a man in that vegetative state and she'll come up and go... What you thinking about? <laughs> Now then. <laughs> we got to think about something. No, I was thinking about nothing. <laughs> that guy's on a roll till you showed up. <laughs> Go away. All right? Because that's how he handles stress. He just... <sighs> <sighs> now, when a woman is stressed out, she has to talk about it. If she doesn't talk about it, her brain will literally explode. <laughs> so she'll start just, I don't know, might have something to do with this. Not I'm gonna have to that you know, I never thought about this. My brother will be here to be in number one. Blah, blah. And and I know men who run from their wives when they do this. <laughs> they do I say, I say well, why, why do you run from her? He says, because I don't know what to tell her. I said, dear God, man, who told you to tell her anything? <laughs> she wants you to tell her anything. See, a lot of guys, they feel obligated when, when you start explaining all your stress, they feel obligated to fix you, right? Because that's what a man does. A man only tells his troubles to another man in hopes that that man will help fix it, okay? But she's not a man. And you try and fix her, she gonna kill you. <laughs> She doesn't want your advice. She doesn't want your help. She wants you to shut up and listen. <laughs> and a couple of ladies. That's right, you tell him. Tell him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> they like that. <laughs> now I had one guy tell me, he said, man, if he, she just tell me how she feels. I said, she doesn't know yet. So what he means, that's how she figures out how she feels, by connecting this wire to that wire, this wire, and so on. Now, because they love each other, they offer to each other their answer, their solution. 
A man senses his wife is stressed out. He loves the girl. He offers to the girl his best and finest solution. I just quit talking about it. <laughs> just, just quit thinking about it. And that's when she starts reaching for the knives and stuff. But she's gonna stab you if you keep it up, okay? Now, a woman, she senses her husband's all stressed out. She loves him. Therefore, she offers to him her best and finest solution. Go away. <laughs> he doesn't want to talk to you. Leave him alone. He will not die. He's not a woman. All right. I know you've got to talk him through or you're going to be twisted inside. He's not like that. Leave the boy alone. You tell he's stressed out, just let him go to his nothing box. Just stay away. Stay away. Okay, and it's hard for us to understand that because we, we think so differently from each other. Now, not only does this affect the way that we respond and stress and stuff, the way our brains are wired also affects the way that we use words. Okay, men tend to use less words than women. That's because the women have all the wires they're trying to connect and they've got to explain each and every connection. <laughs> Now, they say that if a man needs to speak 10,000 words in a day, a woman needs to speak 20,000. My wife says, that's because we got to repeat everything we say. <laughs> to which I responded, huh? <laughs> Where is my darling redhead? Is she around? Come up, I want you to meet my wife, Debbie. Come on up here. And just... <laughs> People say, well, doesn't she talk too? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not to you anyway, she talks to me, but she won't. She won't talk to you because she doesn't want to talk to you. That's all. <laughs> Where's my, my tablet? I want to show you something about the, the, the whole words thing. Um, you know, they actually measured this. They went in and, and uh, studied uh, children and babies and found out that they actually went and took cameras and put them in nurseries and analyzed the pictures later. And they, they noticed the, the pictures of the little girls. Right from the get-go, their mouths are just going. <laughs> It's true. It's true. And then they analyze the pictures of little boys, and they're just... <laughs> they're still thinking, what was that? I want to go back. I don't get it. Okay? Um, very, th then they went and, and they recorded conversations of little boys and girls on playgrounds. And they went back and analyzed them. And uh, they discovered that little girls loved to talk. They were very articulate, loved to use full sentences, just loved to talk. And if they didn't have anybody to talk to, they were perfectly content to talk to nobody. <laughs> and they were just, la, 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 just, just complete sentences. Then they analyzed the conversations of the little boys, and only about 55% of it was intelligible. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what they were saying. You know, just like, uh, uh, ha, 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 yes. That's, that's conversation to a man, okay? Now, 
Not only do we use different amounts of words, words can mean different things to men and women. For example, Now, to most men, five minutes means five minutes. <laughs> to a lot of women, it can be an indefinite period of time. <laughs> Are you ready yet? Five more minutes! <sighs> <laughs> As we discussed, Men understand nothing. <laughs> women don't understand the significance of nothing. If a woman says nothing, look out, it's something. <laughs> oh, dude, man, dude, man, I don't know what happened. What, why, why, what happened? I don't know, I asked my wife what she was upset about. What'd she say, what'd she say? Well, she said nothing. Now, this is not a word, it's a vocalization, it's a sigh. <sighs> now, when a man sighs, it means everything is good with life. <sighs> when a woman sighs, it means you are an idiot. <sighs> Go ahead, he's being polite. When a woman says, go ahead, she's giving you the opportunity to explain whatever stupid thing it was you just did. <laughs> but you need to be very careful in the explanation because it's very likely to be followed by a sigh. <laughs> which will lead to an argument over nothing. And then you ain't gonna have sex again for at least five minutes. I told you that was gonna happen. There's a lot for us to learn about that. And we're gonna continue right there, but we've got about 15 minutes left. So we're going to put some questions on the screen. And the first one is to just get to know each other a little bit. So enjoy the time. And then at, um, oh, you also have questions on the table. There's um, only four, one per couple. But we hope that you're obviously not going to finish the, um, all the questions at the table. But you can take it home and you can talk about the... Um, some of the things that were on the video, and you're going to love it. So I'll close this in about 15 minutes.
Mm -mm. You're on the wrong side. Hey guys, we're just going to pause for a second um, and we're going to close in prayer. We want to mention one thing though before we do. First of all, we're really glad you're here. It's a great crowd. You are almost as good as the crowd on the video. <laughs> and, and I want you to know the video gets better and better and better. It does. So um, you're going you're gonna to love it. But um, we know some of you are struggling in some areas. And we want you to know that we will meet with you um, after you go through the six classes. We'll, Ernie and I will meet with you once to help you get on the right track. And we can direct you to other pastoral care. We have great pastors in this church and um, or professional care just to get you going in the right direction because your marriage is so valuable to God. It's, it's beyond our understanding, really. So we're going to keep working on it. So go ahead, Ernie, pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for tonight. I pray for each and every person in this room, Lord, that you will give them something special to encourage them, to motivate them, and to love them. I pray that they will be renewed in their minds. I pray that they would have a renewed desire to really change anything that you tap them on the shoulder about, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We desire to be your people who obey you and who love one another. And we ask that you would do that in all of us. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. Amen. All right, don't forget your kids. <laughs> oh, I worship, I worship.